Hey Slingers, welcome back for another week of the Word Slinger Podcast. I appreciate you being here. Now, this week I'm chatting with fellow archaeological thriller author Ernest Dempsey, or Ernie, as his friends call him. Uh, now, he and I, uh, we write in the same genre, so this was a great conversation, and uh, we actually have a lot in common. So, I think you're going to enjoy this one. It's all about his work, about uh, what he does to uh, get ideas, uh, and, of course, the importance of being earnest. How could I resist? Now, stick around after the interview. I've got some some really interesting news about the indie publishing industry that you're going to want to tune in for. So keep to your screens and check out this interview with my good friend, Ernest Dempsey. It's the Word Slinger Podcast, where story matters. Build your brand. Write your book. Redefine who you are. It's all about the story here. What's yours now? Here's the guy who invented pants optional, Kevin Tomlinson, the word slinger. Word slinger. Hey, everybody. This is, of course, Kevin Tomlinson, and I'm talking to a guy. I've met this cat at at least once in uh, IRL, we'll say, uh, at Nink. Uh, This is Ernest Dempsey. Now, here's the deal. Ernest Dempsey, he's the author of the Sean Wyatt thrillers, and those are, as he pointed out, archaeological thrillers. Uh, let me turn off those alerts, by the way. But uh, now I've got, I've got Ernest to thank or blame, uh, depending on how you look at it, for <laughs> finally having a way to refer to my Dan Kotler thrillers, man. So I owe you big for that one because uh, I've been banging my head against the table for for a good solid year now trying to figure out the best way to categorize that. So welcome to the show, man. First, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. I'm turning, I'm make- I'm actually turning my alerts off on my phone to make sure that I don't. Have- I know. Yeah. I'm a cautionary <laughs> tale now. It's usually on <laughs> vibrate. I don't, it, well, it was off. I was just making sure. So yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Well, anyone listening, uh, that, <laughs> that was Johnny Andrews who just, uh, dinged me. So you can, you can go yell at him. Um, so man, uh, first of all, it was, it was fantastic hanging out with you at Nick because uh, you and I are, I think we're very like-minded. Um, although you're more into sports than I am by far. I, I have no, no serious love for sports. I wish I wasn't because all of my teams are terrible. <laughs> like, I mean, from, from baseball to basketball, or I don't watch basketball, but yeah. baseball to football and yeah, it's, well, I, I did become a Houston Astros fan recently. Uh, mm, mm. <laughs> they made it that, easy on me. That was a great World Series. That was cool. I was and I was rooting hard for them. Uh, yeah. Apologies to my California fan base. But <laughs> I uh, man, it was great to see, and in, in the city of Houston needed that. But it was also, you know, the, I I don't like to see franchises go so long without getting a title. No kidding. All of my franchises do that. So right. Right. I mean, from the beginning of time, basically, was the wait. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the thing is, my wife and I, we both love baseball. We'll watch baseball. Uh, that's one of the few sports that we're kind of, we get sort of gung-ho about. And so we were actually uh, traveling during the final, like, two games of the of the oh, series, yeah. watching it in, like, random bars, at, you know, uh, all across Colorado Springs and that sort of thing. So it was, there's an extra veneer of awesome associated with it now because – yeah. You know, we were celebrating. It was the weirdest thing to be in a completely different ecosystem and people are rooting for our home team, you know? So yeah, yeah. It makes you feel appreciated. Man. So uh, yeah. aside from sports, uh, you, you have a healthy interest in archaeological thrillers, I'm told. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why don't you tell me a little bit about the uh, Sean Wyatt thrillers, man? Um, well, what, what would you like to know? You know? I'm reading my first one now. <laughs> the very first one, the introductory book for me is is your latest book. The first book? No, no, no. I'm I'm reading your your most current one, the one that you just oh, the, oh, the newest one. So you just you dove in with book fourteen, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Is so that bad? Should I jump? No, 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 no. It's fine. So are you finding your way around? Okay, like with the so characters far. in the world and everything. Yeah, so far so good. I've I've barely scratched the surface on it, but uh. uh yeah, so far, man. I, I don't well, want to stab you or anything. That's the- no, you're good. So uh, the Sean Wyatt archaeological thrillers are, um, they're, they're a series I came up with, I don't know, 2006, 2007, something like that. And yeah. um, the first idea came from uh, a place I visited 
in Northwest Georgia called Fort Mountain State Park. And I'd been going there on picnics and stuff since I was a kid. Right. But I hadn't been there in years. And then around like 2000, I don't know, it's six or seven. We, I went there on a picnic with uh, the girl I was dating and my, my cousins and, um, and his, my cousin and his family and um, we're walking around. And that was the first time I'd been there as an adult. And I started reading the, the historical placards that they had mm-hmm. on, on the site. And um, there's this ancient wall that's there and they, nobody knows who put it there. They don't know why it's there it's not a circular wall. So it's not a defensive like military style wall. It's linear. It, it kind of, you know, undulates, looks like a snake sort of. And there's all these giant pits um, on one side of it, like every, every so often, and they're not spaced out evenly. But uh, I was, uh, I was like, man, this is fascinating. Like I never realized I've been coming there my whole life. And, um, and it was, it was just like nobody knew why it was there and who built it. Right, <laughs> I was like, that right. sounds like a great plot device for a story. Yeah. So, um, I had enjoyed, uh, reading Clive Cussler a lot in, um, in college. I, I, I used to read a lot of fantasy stories in high school and in, in mm-hmm. before high school and, uh, read, I read a lot of the Dragonlance Chronicles and stuff like that. And then, uh, but I got into history when I was in high school and, um, one of my teachers, Mr. Pinnell, really turned me on to, to history. And so um, I started reading things that were skewed that way, especially when I got to college. And that's how I found like, Kussler and those guys. And so right. I thought, man, I, I would love to write a story about this mystery. And so I came up with the characters and um, built the fictional uh, International Archaeological Agency. I couldn't come up with a better name than that. And so... Uh, I even I think I crack a few jokes in a, in a couple of the books about how the name needs to change because that's such a mouthful, right? And um, <laughs> and and you know, Cussler's got like Numa, and he's got that whole thing, and right, right. Um, this is not marine based, and I'm definitely not ripping his idea off, but um, it's but I wanted to do something similar because I just thought it was a cool idea, and so uh, I created these characters, and they travel the world salvaging stuff and sometimes you know finding themselves in trouble and uh and you know deep and finding themselves in deep mysteries and things like that so that's how it came about but the the first book was certainly like it was definitely plot driven like it was um and you know the experts say don't do that do character driven stories but uh yeah it seemed to work out okay and now i really focus hard on the characters so oh really you change, yeah. you kind of change the approach then. Yeah. So what I do is I, I find the plot device I want to use mm-hmm. and um, the next one, the, the next Sean Wyatt book, which will be out in probably late winter um, is, uh, is going to be a Templar story because I've, I've been putting that off for a while. I wanted to make yeah. sure I did it right. Everybody every, does every thriller writer has to write something about the, the Knights Templar. Yeah. Yeah. And I've had lots of readers <laughs> asking me to do it. I'm like, I've been waiting cause everybody's done that and I want to make sure I do something special. So, um, I'm researching that a little bit, but what I do now is I find the device like, okay, Knights Templar. And then I create the characters behind um, up. I do that up front and I, and I really dive in and try to get to know them. And I didn't, I didn't want to do that originally because I was lazy. Right. It seemed like a lot of work, but now it's like, I like doing it that way and it makes the story so much richer and more fun to write. So I don't know if I answered your question. You did too. You totally did. You totally did. <laughs> uh, so you, uh, well, okay. So your your the first book was inspired by essentially a trip, right? Yep. So what what about the uh, the uh, subsequent books? Like, what where are you taking your inspiration? Where are you finding the stories? Yeah. So uh, that is a good question. Well, so just to touch on my characters really quick, forgot to do that. My my characters are um, you know, Sean White's the main character, but his sidekick is almost like a co main character, Tommy Schultz. Uh, I really liked how Clive did the the character. You know, they had the, him and his best friend, Dirk Pitt and his best friend, um, right. Al Giardino, or, or, you know, they're they're always in trouble together. So I really liked that. So I wanted to do that. Sean's a former government agent, and um, he wanted to get out of the game. He was working for an extrajudicial uh, agency called Axis, and um, 
Tommy, uh, he, he wanted to, he decided to, you know, start working with his friend Tommy and that's how they became, they, they got into the, all this mischief together. Um, but as far as where it's go, um, like how do I find stuff? Uh, yeah. So sometimes it comes from like places I've been. So I, I was fortunate enough to travel, um, a little bit when I was, um, in high school and in college and then a little bit after that as well. So sometimes, uh, what I write stories about is places that I have been physically. Right. And then, uh, sometimes I write, sometimes I have to find stuff. So I have to, I go out on the internet and I start looking for mysteries, but usually what happens is I just, I just keep an eye on the magazine rack at Barnes and Noble. And, um, I, I look at things. In fact, I just bought, I posted this on my author fan page. It's not lying around here. I don't think, Oh, it might be in my bag. Um, <laughs> so this is, but this is why this is important, you know, so you right, keep yeah. an eye on the stuff that you, you know, on, on the internet that comes through your newsfeed or whatever. Sometimes I do active searching for, you know, current things in, in the world of history and archeology. span And by the way, you know, I, I'm no archaeologist. I'm not an expert at, you know, you know, detailing little mm-hmm. bits of rock and dirt and stuff like that. So when it's, you know, when it's called an archaeological thriller, it's it's real heavy on the thriller and medium on the archaeology because I <laughs> right. Nobody nobody's right. going to uh, read a book to like about, you know, somebody who was sitting in a dig site for 8 hours in the hot sun brushing a rock for, you know, that whole time. <laughs> So that there's maybe a, there's bound to be an audience. that, and I apologize to the archaeologists that are out. They're going to I'm going to get so much hate mail from that. That's not it. You do an amazing job, and I appreciate it. But <laughs> you got to have some gunfights and some action scenes. Right. So, um, so anyway, this is how this. I found this um, yeah. when I was on vacation. Right. This is a History Channel magazine, and. I don't know if that's just a barcode, but you can see hundred greatest mysteries. Right. And I was like, Oh, there's my next hundred books. And then I was, <laughs> I'd written about like 10 of those things. So there's my next 90 books. Here's what's funny. <laughs> I, own, that same I own that exact magazine yeah. <laughs> and bought it for the exact same reason. I also picked up while I was uh, on the same trip, a, uh, a coffee table book called Mi- mysteries of history uh, yeah. that has a ton of, of quirky little historic facts about, about history. <laughs> well, that's awesome. I actually, one of the, I meant to, I meant to have this on hand and I don't see it laying around, but it was a book that belonged to my grandparents. Mm-hmm. And um, when, when they passed, we, you know, we went through, um, when my grandfather passed, we went through the house and found, you know, things we wanted to keep or sell or whatever. And, and I was little and I saw that book and it was like seven ancient mysteries of the world or something like that. And I was like, oh, I gotta right. keep this. So yeah, anytime I see anything like this, and for those listening and not watching the video, I'm holding up a History Channel magazine that's the 100 Greatest Mysteries: The World's Secrets Revealed. So um, I love to look through stuff like that, whether it's physical or online, and I find things that I think are super cool, and then I write about them. Now I've got a readership that emails me ideas. So <laughs> right, <laughs> they're, they're like, "Hey, have you seen this?" And they'll send me a link to an article or something. So now I don't yeah. even have to. Which I I consider that safer, uh, but yeah. I I've I've had to start discouraging readers from from basically pitching to me right. because you know no one wants to be sued, and I, I don't you know no. if I'm already. I've actually literally had readers send me ideas that I was already writing about. So yeah. I had to really quickly backtrack. <laughs> like, yeah. I can't take it. But if they'll send you articles or something, I'm, I'm all about that. I love when people tag me on stuff like that. Yeah, they don't send the ideas as much. Uh, that happened a few times, but it's mostly been like articles to like a, a something that was found recently might have might be in you know some historical website or you know, article or something like that. So. Right. Yeah. Right. It's, those, that's always cool to get those. I, I, I keep counseling people to go write their book, man. That's a great idea. You should go write that book. And yes, that will either shut them up or get them very excited. So, and yeah. I would prefer they get really excited and go write the book. <laughs> I'm like, I would totally read that book if you wrote it. Yes. Uh, so you're okay. So we're very similar in that. I mean, we okay. go and hunt down. Yeah. 
that's, that's probably, I don't know, man, I've talked to a whole, a whole bunch of other thriller authors and that's not necessarily what they do, but I think, uh, yeah. the archeological thrillers, um, it kind of lends itself to that. Like you, you just came across some quirky fact of history. Yeah. You know, the, the um, the other stuff that's you know, like a spy thriller or, um, you know, any, any other kind of thrillers, uh, requires, and I'm, again, I'm not bashing it cause I write some of those too. I write them much faster. Yeah. They require almost no research. You just have to know your guns and your geography and, um, have sort of a, a semblance of an idea of how government works, which is, um, it doesn't, but, um, <laughs> but the, uh, no, but the, yeah, you, you just, and then you just sit down and go, um, with these, it takes, it just depends on the size of the novel, but sometimes maybe I'm fielding a future question, but it usually takes like 20 to hundred hours worth of research to get it right yeah. um, with these. And, and what I do is start early with, I start with a bunch of research up front and then um, it's kind of an ongoing thing. Like I'll have to ch fact check stuff as I go. But So how do you do the, the actual research? So you get the idea from a magazine or some other source and then you go do some actual research. Like how do you typically handle that? Well, since I have a two and a half year old, I don't get to travel around like Dan Brown. So uh, I can't, I can't excuses, be jet setting man. off to Hong Kong. It's just and, excuses. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And I don't spend four, four years in Spain to, to yeah. writing your next book. Yes. I, I did not spend four years in a Tibetan monastery fasting and eating nothing but grass and meditating all day long to learn the true ways of the, the monks there. <laughs> um, no, I basically what I people, a lot of readers ask me this and um, I, I always tell them the same thing. So it's, my research comes from a couple places. One, I used to read a lot of historical books. So it comes from memory from that. Some of it, some of it comes from internet research, which right. has been wonderful. It's, it's been very cool to be able to do that. And, uh, and, and the internet speeds up the process for sure. And then the other thing, the main, I do travel a little bit to, especially some of the United States locations. So mm -hmm. that's easy enough. But the biggest thing is that um, when I do get to take a trip, um, whether it was a long time ago, like 1994, when I first went to Germany and Italy and Switzerland and Austria, or if it was just last year when I went on a fishing trip to Alaska, I always pay attention. I pay attention to everything. Right. So, um, and I, I take lots of, I don't take as many pictures now as I did back then. Um, now I just really try to remember stuff. Right. So, um, and that's actually a lot of my stuff details about locations come from past travels and past experiences. So that enables me to write the people a little better, the atmosphere, um, you know, the smells of the, like the smell of the air and that sort of thing. And, um, I also talk the other, there's another component to the research, which is I talk to people. So Mm -hmm. I have a lot of readers now and they're more than happy to share experiences from their lives. Um, and, and, you know, tell me little stories about places they went and when they offer those, I ask for more details. So, um, I spoke to this one girl who went on a mission trip to Uganda a few years ago with the invisible children. Thing, right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, to, to take down Coney and whatever to, to help out with that. And, um, I asked her, I said, so what was it like? And she said, it was amazing. It was, it was an amazing experience. And, um, it was, it was just so cool. And I was like, that doesn't help me out. Like, I want to know how is the food? Was the food <laughs> terrible? Was it salty? Was it sweet? Was right. it bland? Did you eat roaches? Did you eat like beef or did you eat like just lettuce and rice every day? what did the air smell like? Did it smell like sewage all the time or was it dry and clean or was it kind of humid? Like, I want to know what that is. Don't tell me it was an amazing life experience. I already, that that's a given. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah. You're looking for the meat, the details. Yes. So I always ask for details like that when people tell me stuff because I want to know so that I can share going forward. And so even though I haven't traveled to Africa, um, in any part of Africa, my stories go from Morocco to Egypt to Chad 
down, I think maybe even to Sudan. Yeah. One of them goes to Sudan. I've never been there, but I can write those places pretty effectively because I pay attention to when, you know, the details from people who have been there. Right. So what do you say? So are you, you're taking in all the sensory information. I mean, are you, are you able to convey like the feeling of the place? Is that sort of the vibe that you get when you're there or what? Yeah. Feel, feeling is difficult for me because I'm, um, I'm a cyborg, so I don't actually have feelings of artificial it, intelligence. I have, I have a mechanical heart. I literally but, but that's how I memorize everything. People yeah. are like, is it an eidetic memory? I'm like, no, I'm a robot. No, um, the feelings, yeah, it is, it is easier, especially with people who are from a place, you know, yeah. and are, have, a, have a real emotional attachment. So I wrote, uh, I've never been to Istanbul, but I wrote a couple of scenes in, in two different books that took place in, in Istanbul. And I was able to do that effectively because I have a friend that's from there. And so from talking to her, just not even like trying to get research out of her, just chatting about her hometown Right. One night over coffee, she like, I was able to glean a lot of good info about that city and that the people and all that stuff. So I, I throw that in there and you make a good case for, for just taking the time to connect to other people uh, yeah. and just have conversations open. You're listening more than talking kind of conversation. Yeah. Which, yeah, and if you hang out with me at a tailgate, you'll find that that's the opposite of what I do. I, uh, if, I, if you come to a football tailgate in Atlanta or a, a soccer tailgate in Chattanooga or something, you'll, I will not shut up. I yeah, talk to yeah I'm the same way. But, <laughs> but, but in a different setting, I will, yeah. In, in between talking too much, I try to listen a lot and, and try to learn as much as I can about people and where they're from and all that, so. Yeah, that's, uh, I think that's a valuable skill for, for authors, man. I mean, yeah, I, I wish I had developed that a little better. Maybe I could work on it. <laughs> well, you know, the other thing is, is that, uh, people like to feel important and they like to feel like you, you give a crap about what they're talking about. And, um, and, it, and that's important. Like you, and you should care what they're talking about. Like you should care who you're talking to, about who you're talking to and what they've been through in life and all that. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's, I, I have that, um, that empathy built in or that, that caring built in already. So um, I always find it really fascinating to meet new people. That's one reason I love going to conferences and hanging out with people like you and other people is, you know, getting to, I'm, it's funny because I, I'm, my instincts are to stay hold up here in my house and work alone like an introvert, but, Right. I also, there's a calling inside to get out there and meet folks and learn more about their worlds and their lives and their path and all that. But right, right. yeah, but, but to your question, I just remembered this. I, um, I was on a vacation in like 2012 down in South Carolina and we stayed at this amazing resort and uh, my, uh, my wife was there for a conference. So we didn't have to, we didn't have to pay for that, which was cool. Those are the best. But, uh, Oh, that's the best. And it was an amazing resort. But when I got there, I was like, I'm going to include this place in a story one day. But it wasn't for like three more years I included it. But I took pictures and I took a lot of mental pictures. I talked to the workers and stuff. And I just, you know, from what I learned, I, like three years later, I wrote a book that included that in a, or maybe two years later, I included it in that story. And yeah, so always pay attention. Yeah. Yeah. I always pay attention. Uh, yeah. I, I, you know, I think I spend half anytime we travel I mean, you know, I, I've, I've been traveling for the past three or four months now. Um, yeah. I'm finally home, but, uh, anytime I'm, I'm out and about in the world, I, I don't necessarily take notes and maybe I should, but I don't, I've never, never felt the need to per se, because I just, you know, sort of absorb the vibe of the place. Uh, although Facebook has become kind of my go-to, note-taking device now <laughs> yeah because i post everything <laughs> yeah i get that <clears throat> yeah so you, okay so, you you've got there's 14 books in your in your sean wyatt thrillers right now right 14 in the can the, the canonical series and then there's uh there's a spin-off trilogy and there's two little short novellas um mm -hmm. that i give away to my readers when they subscribe along with a couple of other full-length books but uh there's there's a spinoff trilogy and then there's um, there's going to be a new spinoff series 
for um, for that character that already had the spinoff, there's going to be a whole new series for her. And then there's going to be um, two other spinoffs that I can think of right now. And right. Um, did that alert, alert just um, go off? I didn't hear a thing. Okay, good. Cause it popped up and I heard it you, in this. You could have snuck by with nothing. You could have, okay. Could have gotten by with a completely unnoticed. How does a, a spinoff trilogy work? What did you do? You uh, you took one of the characters and yeah, like, so secondary characters. Yeah, so Adriana Villa is uh she's a Spanish. Uh, she's she's born in out, out just outside in the countryside of uh, just outside of Madrid in the countryside yeah. of Spain, and uh, her father was um, sort of a an intel mercenary, so he was an expert at getting information. Mm -hmm. um, difficult to get information mm -hmm. and helped the U S government quite a bit along with the allies of the United States government. And for years he did that, but then he's, he's gone into hiding since then, but his daughter, um, they, their family was wealthy. They owned, uh, you know, coffee farms and vineyards and things like that. And as a result, um, they have plenty of money. And so Adriana leaned towards a life of adventure. Mm -hmm. And so after she got done at col with college and all that, um, she, she became very interested with um, the missing artwork from World War II. So um, the Monuments Men stuff was, right. uh, is, you know, all that's very true all that stuff happened. The Nazis took a lot of art and stole art from galleries and private, you know, private exhibits in people's homes and things like that. And so sort of her mission is to um, locate the missing, you know, the art that's missing as much of it as she can and return it either to the proper heirs or the governments from which it was stolen. And so as a result of that, she ends up in a lot of, uh, a lot of mysteries, a lot of adventures of her own. And so the spinoff trilogy that I did involves her and another character that were that appeared in the first novel that I wrote. And she was also a thief. And these two, the, the spinoff trilogy is called War of Thieves. And essentially, um, I'm trying to think if I'm giving spoilers. I don't think yeah. so. It's been a while since I wrote that book. Right. So, um, but yeah, they are pitted against one another by this group called the syndicate that is uh, this group, this collection of ultra billionaires. And essentially they just like to manipulate people for their own entertainment. Mm -hmm. And so they pit these two against each other to find the series of paintings that went missing. And so it's, uh, it's sort of like most dangerous game meets monuments men. That's the right. best way I could uh, describe it. And so, um, th that's how that, that spinoff trilogy goes. But the new spinoff series involves her um, and a new extrajudicial agency called the Shadow Cell. That's, uh, that's th the main purpose of it is to um, rid the world of terrorists. So, Okay. I can give so a they, Yeah, yeah. And so I'm not going to give this away, but one of the characters from the rest of the stories um, is – not in charge of this agency, but she's big in it. And um, everybody always asked me, you know, what's the deal with this character? Right. You know, there's something more to this person. And I'm like, yes, there is. Don't worry about it. You'll find out in 2018 <laughs> or late 2017. Don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah. Relax so there's that. It. Yeah. So that's going to be a series of spy thrillers. They're shorter books. They're going to be you know, like 125 pages, 150 pages a piece. And um, some of them might be 200 pages, but that's, that's the main spinoff for that. And then there's some other characters in the world that um, are going to get their own spinoff series that are going to be focused on the history stuff. And then I'm working on another series called the adventure guild, which is um, a series for kids. And I'm co-writing that with my ninth grade cousin. Oh, really? That's cool. He's, that's, that's interesting. Chandler's getting after it. Like I, uh, I started writing in high school, but I never finished anything. He's already right. finished like three or four stories. Wow. And these are like 80 page stories to hundred page stories. Like find me a ninth grader that's written 50 pages of anything. Exactly. I, I had never did that. So 
he's got some really cool ideas. He's, um, he really likes superhero stories. So he's focusing on that. But the Adventure Guild is uh, a group of middle school kids who do Indiana Jones type stuff. So it's archaeological thrillers for kids. Yeah, look at that. Way to so, bring it back around. <laughs> way to so, way to give back, man. Pay it. There, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> man, okay. Yes, yeah, that's, that's pretty cool. I uh I do appreciate that. That's like a mentorship kind of thing. That's uh <laughs> that's pretty remarkable. Yeah, no one, oh yeah. No, the really kids in my sphere would do that. I mean, they, I have some very talented kids uh related to me, but they they wouldn't want to work with me on anything. They would just go to it and probably surpass me in the process. So. Yeah. Chandler's cool, man. And he, he, uh, he works really hard at it. He's, um, he's away at a boarding Academy now about 30 minutes South of Chattanooga, maybe 45 minutes South of Chattanooga. But, um, so I don't, uh, I don't get to, we, in the summers we meet up a lot and we do a lot of storyboarding and stuff like that. Um, we did that this last summer before he left for school, but yeah. we started working on this project together when he was in eighth grade. And, uh, he has, a, he has a lot of good ideas for it. And so, um, when I finish the draft the like I'm working on the first story now. So when I finish the rough draft, I'll send it to him and see what he thinks and have him make corrections and things. And then we'll edit and all that. But yeah, wow. my wow. first collaboration product project is with, uh, family. So. Yeah, man, you're breaking all the rules. You're working with kids, you're working with family. Well, I told him. Well, I told him. I said, "Channel," because uh, he was asking me for like his his mom asked me for tips, you know, and advice. And I said, "Forget advice. I'll show him exactly what he needs to do, and I'll work with him on it." And so, uh, I, I sat down. The first time I sat down with him, I said, "I hope that he does a podcast someday." An, an interview with somebody and remembers this, but I said to him, which would you rather do in high school? Would you rather like get a part-time job like your dad and I did, or would you like to write books and, and you know, that's how you supplement your income while you're in school. And he's Man. like, I'd rather write books. And I'm like, exactly. Dude, that's the so. most awesome story I have ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. <laughs> oh, see you guys. You've been Wait, a wonderful that's audience. That's it. Mic Talk drop. We're out. <laughs> <laughs> Dang. Okay. Um, you are uh, you're a USA Today bestseller. Yeah. Is that a just a completely recent event, or had you been one before this recent? No, it's totally recent. Yeah, that just happened in October. So. And you you were very intentional about it. I remember you talking to me about it. Like you're, you're gonna do this. I'm gonna make this happen. You made it happen. What was yep. what did you end up having to do? What did it take to hit the list? Yeah, so I mean, it's all I've heard different things about. Um, you know, the the New York Times list and the USA Today list. They're both curated lists, from what I understand. Right. Uh, so you can sell enough copies to make New York Times, and then the editor can decide to not put you in there because uh, they want another book in there. Right. From what I understand, USA Today is not as bad about that, but. Um, you just got to sell a lot of books. And, um, I had a book bub feature for a book I released last year. And so I thought, okay, this is a perfect chance to leverage this and see if I can get there because I knew I would need, you know, ballpark, like 6,000 books sold that week of that book to, um, to hit the list. And, mm -hmm. um, so I knew that a book bub feature deal was good for at least 2,500, um, you know, at least 2000 on one day and maybe five or 600 on another day. Right. So, and then I knew the visibility would carry it a little bit, you know, for, you know, several hundred more. So I figured with that, I'm already halfway there. I'd be doing myself a disservice if I didn't do a big campaign push to try to hit that list. So, um, so I did it and I, I, I ran a bunch of, a, a bunch of advertising on BookBub CPM ads and, um, in Facebook advertising and yeah, I moved to like 8,000 books globally. And I think a little over 6,000, uh, in the USA, which is what matters to USA today. They don't count the other stuff. It's That's all within just, just the first week. That's just that week. Just that week. Yeah. It's, it goes from Monday to Sunday they, night. They so. must, they must be looking though at, um, you, you need to be wide in order to do this, I think, because, 
I know plenty of people who do more than 6,000 a week on a release for uh, like KU, but. Yeah, well, it depends, right? So I don't think they count borrows and I don't right. think that they, uh, and I, uh, yeah, I don't know. There's you know, like, there's people that are in the know mm -hmm. more than me. I know like Cheryl Bradshaw and Diane Capri know way more about that stuff than I do. And they're, right. um, and they, by the way, were extremely helpful for me when I was, uh, trying to make that push and, and having dinner with them and at, at Nink really, right. Like it was a, it was a big, I, I love light Diane. she's, she's one of my favorite people. <laughs> They're awesome. And it's so funny that I was great that I got to meet her because, uh, I'd been interacting with her online for so long and, and yeah. uh, never actually sat down and chatted with her in person and never even seen her in person. So that was cool. But yeah, so the, the, the issue with, hitting that list really has more to do with timing than anything else. So mm -hmm. some weeks, like if you try to hit that list in February, it might take 5,000 units instead of six. And if you try or like right now, as of the recording of this, you know, like a week before Thanksgiving, you'd probably have to move seven to seven and a half thousand units in the USA to hit that list because right. the competition is so much higher. Right. So, um, so you're saying do it in the dead of summer is the better way to go do it in the do it uh i did it I, my timing was great because it was the I, and it was totally by accident but um i was just lucky the the book bub feature i had was a week before most of the traditional publishers released their their right, christmas right. stock um, or their late fall stock and so the next week uh, what i the, the, i mean what one week later the volume i moved probably wouldn't have done it so yeah. But, you know, the other thing, too, um, on top of the market, this is what's crazy. Like, I didn't do any, I didn't do anything with other authors. So I didn't ask them, you know, if they would help out and reach out to their readers that might like my stuff. I didn't, I don't like doing, I don't like bothering people about that. Um, if somebody emails me and asks me to do that, I'll, I'll take a look at their books. And if it fits, you know, what my readers like, then I'll, I'll do it. Yeah. Um, but you know, like I know you and uh, Jack Patterson and some other guys that you know, that are like me. We don't use all. We don't use. I don't use any profanity in my stories. Right. And um. And you Very guys are little. I maybe have a yeah. little here and there, but that's, yeah. And there's not. There's no sex and stuff like that. And so. Right. Um. I'm happy to promote other authors who have stories, um, along those lines, even if they aren't archaeological thrillers. If they're spy stories or whatever. Yeah, right. that's right. I, I just drop it in there. <laughs> dropping it in there. I think it's going to be a drinking game now for yeah. <laughs> every time archaeological thriller. Uh, I'm waiting for Barnes and Amazon and Apple to put the category up. I don't know what's the, what the that needs to be its own bicep category, man. Right. When you got guys like you, you got Cussler, you got Dan Brown, you got a whole bunch of people out there writing that genre. I mean, and selling, you know, mega hitting mega lists and stuff. I mean, come oh, on, yeah. it needs to be its own bicep category. How it's not is uh, nobody's thought of it. Who like, do we lobby? Who do we approach? We need to I, find the governing body of the bicep. I've never had an original idea before, so I, I have no idea. <laughs> like this is the first time. <laughs> well, and it's funny because as soon as you said that, we were at Nink. As soon as you said that, I'm like, holy crap, that's exactly what it is. <laughs> and then I'm like. We've no one has ever thought of this before, and then I go online and I look and I'm like, oh yeah, everybody's thought of it. It's it's everywhere. There's everybody who writes anything remotely like what we write puts it in archaeological thriller. Do so, they really? Yeah, we just Thank we just completely missed on my it. Thank we just you completely so missed it, but that's yeah. okay. <laughs> it it so means no, it works. <laughs> so I'm still looking for my original idea. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> one day, one day your your ship will come in. Someday, <laughs> it's gonna have one crate, but uh, it'll be there. One crate, that's it. <laughs> one crate. Well, you know what um, they say: I ideas are a dime a dozen, but execution is everything. So. Yeah, man. And I, I had this conversation with someone recently uh, that, and I forget who it was. Maybe it was you. Uh, we we're talking about how you know, or no, actually, I think I was. I think it was. It comes from uh, Dan Brown's latest uh, origin talking uh, about the fact that anyone can have the idea and uh, it's, it's, it really is all about the execution. Uh, but it's not just the execution either. It's, it's individual 
taste, individual style can influence the impact of that idea, you know? So mm -hmm. nothing we write about really is all that original. I mean, I wrote a book about finding Atlantis and yeah. uh, there's nothing original about that as an idea. Uh, right. But I made it original with, by adding other elements. So yes, there. <laughs> and I haven't read that yet, but I'm really interested mm -hmm. in doing it because um, I'm fascinated about like Atlantis and all that. Like, I think that um, it's a cool, what would you call it? A plot? I don't know if it's a plot device, but yeah, I mean, um, the, the whole Atlantis thing is so fascinating. I mean, yeah, I grew up that was a, a whole pressing story. I mean, you know, yes. it has been for thousands of years, but I mean, there's yep. nothing remarkable about that, but you know, that was one of those stories like you talked about earlier that just, I, I, I you want to know so bad what the truth is <laughs> that you probably mull over a thousand possibilities. I could write a hundred books about the discovery of Atlantis and every one of them would have a different plot. So yeah, well, maybe I should. <laughs> my theory on uh, on Atlantis, and I'm sure this isn't an original idea either, but um, as a creationist, I I often uh, get into discussions with people who don't believe in a creator or creation right. uh, creation theory, which is funny because it's just as valid a theory as evolution. Right. But um, I get into discussions about that, and they're like, "For oh, okay, so you believe in the flood story? Yeah." You believe that there's an, somewhere in this world, there's enough water to cover Mount Everest. And my answer is no. The water is still there. Like, yeah. like whatever civilizations were destroyed, I think are still underwater. Yeah. And I think that the waters receded. And there's, why does every culture have a flood story? Every, every culture. Every culture. That, yeah. And people are like, People, they, they, the naysayers are like, well, you know, word travels fast. No, it doesn't. But it, it, there, there are cult, completely disconnected cultures that have. Yeah, not since Pangea. Right. Like, and you can say, well, people traveled. And yeah, I do believe that there was intercontinental, you know, boat travel before we even imagined, before Columbus right. and before all that. I do believe that. But it's like, you cannot tell me that. Incans up on the top of Machu Picchu and people in Japan have the same, sim they have similar stories. Right. The cultures are vastly different. There's right. no way they were communicating and they, it's not a shared thing. Like they, these people all experienced the same thing. Well, if they were communicating, that's a whole other story to tell. Like that's a, right. <laughs> there's something else there, man. Yeah. Yeah. But I, that's my theory about Atlantis is that it was a, a great civilization that, that was, that's, it's still underwater and maybe it, maybe it happened pre, maybe it was there pre-flood and that's where the legends came from, or maybe it was post-flood. Mm -hmm. I don't know, but, uh, well, you've heard, uh, you, did you hear about the, uh, they discovered a, a, a lost underwater city like off the coast of Australia that's been kind of right there under everyone's nose for. Um, I want to say I saw that article come through my, somebody sent it to me, I think one of my you, readers. You, if you're not already, you need to subscribe to Atlas Obscura on online. Hold I on. need to buy the book. The book is amazing. Uh, I'm putting it on my phone. I'm making a note. You totally Atlas. need to do it. <laughs> Obscura. And now I have to put it in the mentions of the show. Damn it. I hate when I mention things. Obscura. <laughs> Hold on everybody while we while we both go and add <laughs> Yeah, I'm just I'm I'm working while I'm doing the interview. I'm, I'm Man, coming. that's it never um, stops, dude. It never stops. Well, right. you know, there's so much there's so much we don't know about the ancient world and it's crazy because the world's getting smaller all the time and we keep we keep finding this stuff. Um you know, like, uh, what is it, uh, Golecki Tempe or whatever in Turkey, uh -huh. you know, that's, yeah. they're, they're saying that that civilization was 10 or 11,000 years old. There's Aboriginal stuff that's like 40,000 years old. And there's, um, you know, there's, they found those giant, have you seen the giant underwater stones they found off the coast of Japan? Like those, right. those things are clearly shaped and angled and they're massive. There's the Bimini road down uh down the caribbean there's right. i mean there's oh i guess it's off the coast of florida maybe but like or bahamas i don't remember but it's incredible all the stuff we don't know 
uh, about the ancient world and the antediluvian world and all that stuff. And I'm just glad that people like you write archaeological thrillers to <laughs> delve into those possibilities. Back at you, brother. That's what. Uh, <laughs> that's why we're here. We're here to keep each other entertained and distracted yes. uh, while the rest of the world goes on with their their silly little uh political wars yes uh, <laughs> so all right man well we're we're at time um, oh wow that went fast i know man that's the way it goes when you ha- when you're having fun they, yeah. they, they go very quickly did um, you get all your questions asked and- man i never have questions in advance i should okay. have told you i should have said something about that when we started i make no, this up. Okay. I make everything up i'm a complete pantser in everything i do I, di- I did mean to ask you if you're a potter or a pantser though you're clearly uh, but- a potter both. So I, I do what I call a story. I do a scene map or a story map at the beginning. So I, I write the end. I write what I want to happen at the end. Mm-hmm. And then um, <clears throat> sometimes I don't do that, but usually I write what happens at the end and then I know where I'm going. And yeah. then um, I work in Scrivener. So I just go in and <clears throat> I put chapter by chapter a very, like a one line synopsis of what happens in every chapter. Uh-huh. And, um, that's kind of how I storyboard it. And that's, that's about the extent of my outline. I do about 2000 to 3000 words of brainstorming um, in my research section of Scrivener so that I, I have a, a, I have a good sense of what's going on and the characters I'll, I'll write, you know, several paragraphs about each character and that sort of stuff. Uh, yeah. The new characters, the old ones, I don't need to do that, but yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I'm like sort of pants, but, when I when I do a good outline, I can write so much faster. Yeah, so. I could see it. I mean, I, I I don't know. I've tried. I've tried to do the outlining thing. I uh, yeah. I did have to finally break down and start keeping. Um, and I, I I've tried all the various software packages to do this, and nothing okay. makes me happy. But I <laughs> I keep an Apple Note for. Uh, with a list of all the characters in my Dan Kotler series, any, any series I write or any books I write, I, I create a note and I have all the characters and I basically have like one or two paragraphs next to each name that says, here's, here's everything. all the important well, stuff about that character. So yeah. no bios, no photos. I don't have any of that stuff. <laughs> and, and you, and you, and you do um, sci-fi as well. You said, yeah, although I've, I've kind I of missed retired. that when we were talking about it. Yeah. Yeah. So I think I screwed you over and did not mean to. <laughs> wow. You said you were kind enough to send something out for me, uh, uh promoting one of my thrillers and I had, I didn't tell you that it was in KU right now. Oh but, yeah. Yeah. No, that's okay. So yeah, no, it's fine. I said, yeah, I recommended your books to my readers and, um, and I got some emails back from the Nook people. Well, like, and here's the deal. They, said that they didn't, they were read on Nook. How can I get this book? And so I was, I they said, tell oh, reach I out to me. Yeah. Tell yeah, yeah. Out. So, tell them to reach out to you. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll help them out. Here, right, cool. Here's the deal. Here's the deal. I, I, I firm. I'm a big believer in don't give advice you're not willing to follow. Right. Yeah. So I have always advised people that the best way to use Kindle Unlimited, if you're going to use it at all, is right at the beginning, build yeah. a platform with it. Uh, you know, get get some money going, get some get some buzz going. You know, get some reviews going. Amazon yep. reviews are very helpful even on other platforms. So sure. I used um, for this tri- this series right now, it's, there are three books and a, and a novella in that series. It's pretty new. So as I'm mm-hmm. writing more books, I'm, I'm dropping it in KU, and then I've got a, a strategy that's based essentially on when – I'm already there, honestly. I'm, I'm considering moving everything wide again. But yeah. uh, once the, the actual sales outnumber the page reads and I'm getting more royalty from sales, then I can start uh, – you know, the strategy is to move outward. So, and probably just a book or two at a time. Uh, but anyway, I was going to – I'm aiming for like – 10 or 12 books before I do that. So, okay. I didn't mean to screw you over. (laughs) You didn't screw me over at all. No, it didn't screw me over. I I was just, uh, no, I I got, I knew I was going to get, when I realized it, I knew I was going to get emails from my, my Apple and my uh, Nook and Kobo readers. But yeah, what would be the best way uh, is, or or do you want me to send, you want to send me that in a private? Yeah, we'll talk. (laughs) <laughs> okay, we'll talk off, off the record about how those people should contact. Let's just say this. I, I am actively looking for excuses 
uh, for data that I can use to say okay. it's time to go wide, right? Okay. Yeah. And I, this is what I tell people all the time. If you've got people who are complaining that they can't get your book on another platform, that's a good problem to have. It's probably yep. time to think about going wide. There so if I get a few thousand people saying, I really like <laughs> your book, but it's not on Nook, it's not on iBooks, you know, well, I'd you be a get Tonight, you will get 100,000 emails. If I do, book. dude, and tomorrow morning, you will be able to buy this book everywhere. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Cool. KDP Select or no KDP Select. All right, man. Um, all right, well, we're going we're gonna to go ahead and wrap up. I, I appreciate you uh, being on, man. I really do. We, I think we're kindred spirits um, in this. For sure. No. Yeah, I, I wish we'd talk more often, but I know we you're will. always on the no, road. No, here's the sad part. I said to you, let's talk. Let's let's be buddies. Let's let's, <laughs> let's work together. And then I promptly disappeared for like three months. <laughs> it's okay. um, so we'll do that. We will do that. I promise you. But um, we are, and at any rate, where can people find you and uh, things you related online? Well, my website's a good place to start, ErnestMC.net. Uh, there's no A in Ernest, so... Um, because I'm, I don't do things earnestly. I do, I'm just earnest. So. You have no idea how difficult it's going to be for me to not name this episode The Importance of Being Ernest Dempsey. You should. I think you should name it that. <laughs> I but leave the A out of Ernest, and then you'll have it. Uh, yes, Oscar Wilde, right? He, uh, he was an interesting character. That was a good story. Um, well, that's a good story, yeah. Yeah, so uh, ErnestDempsey.net or go to Facebook.com slash Ernest Dempsey. I have a fan page there, and um, those are the two best places. But if you go to my website, ErnestDempsey.net, there's a link at the top where you can click that, and it'll take you to a page where you can sign up to get free books and stuff like that. And uh, So I give away like four free digital books um, when Excellent. you sign up. And so That's fantastic. Uh, they get you started in, this, in the series and, and all that, so. All right, man. Okay. Well, uh, on that note, uh, you'll be able to find this, by the way, dear listener and viewer, in the show notes of this episode. So make sure you're looking to know, down below on YouTube uh, and visiting wordslingerpodcast.com for this episode. Uh, don't have a number for you yet, but uh, you'll be able to search Ernest Dempsey and find it. Otherwise, uh, you probably came in from somewhere important like iTunes or Stitcher or Google Play or whatever. So uh, hang out, Ernest. Uh, we're going to do the uh, Word Slinger after show uh, cool. for everyone else. Everybody uh, loves an after party. Everybody loves the after party. Uh, is it for, really? Is it better than the party itself? It is. It is the party. This is yeah. just preamble to the party. So this is a pregame. This we're this pregame. This is, we're in the pregame show. Now we're heading into, uh, yeah, we're, we're getting into crunch time now. So um, everybody, you're probably hearing the groovy theme music. You may dance in place at will. And we'll see you on the other side with some announcements and housekeeping. Otherwise, we'll talk to you all next week. Welcome back. Thanks for sticking around after your interview. Now, I've got some industry news and some other housekeeping stuff. We'll get to that in a minute. But on the industry side, some cool things are happening in this industry. Uh, it's nuts. We've got we've got things I never would have expected. Uh, but this week in particular, uh, something I probably should expect, Barnes & Noble is actually relaunching, they have relaunched, their Nook Press uh, you know, publishing platform. So uh, Nook Press uh, has been around for a while now. It's had a, it's had a few names. I think Barnes & Noble now thinks that the third time is the charm. Because as far as I can tell, this is the third time that they've rebranded their publishing platform. Um, the uh, the recent rebranding uh, has changed the name of it from Barnes & Noble Nook Press to simply Barnes & Noble Press. That's a little bit less of a mouthful to say. Now this program will focus on ebooks and print on demand, so it's a lot like Amazon's KDP services. Um, this is probably in response to Amazon and their cha recent changes in KDP. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of excited about it in particular because of announcements that they are increasing their royalty rate to 65%, um, which honestly puts it about on par with uh, everyone else uh, at this point. But uh, that's on books that are priced $10 or above. Um, and you can also set pre-orders with Barnes & Noble now and the Nook for up to 12 months in advance. So. That's a switch. That's a new change. Now uh, the question remains: um, Is this going to uh, is this going to you know raise their position in the industry? Is this going to help them uh, 
uh, establish some dominance? Uh, is is does this change the future of Barnes and Noble as an ebook publisher and an ebook platform? Uh, you let me know in the comments below. I'd appreciate hearing from you and your insights and your perspective. We've got another great uh, Google Play story this week. Uh, our Draft Digital's partner, <laughs> back in uh, 2017, Draft Digital helped Find a Way launch a program called Find a Way Voices, and now Find a Way Voices has become a gateway to Google Play. Now, Find a Way is essentially the world's largest audiobook distributor. And Find Away Voices is a program that allows indie authors and indie publishers to uh, produce and distribute their work uh, worldwide without any of the exclusivity that they've come that people have come to expect from uh, groups like uh, Audible's uh, ACX, the Amazon ACX program. So there's no exclusivity, no contracts, and now you can get your audiobooks into Google Play. Now. This is important for a lot of reasons. Um, if you are a draft digital author, by the way, you can actually get into Find Away Voices uh, through your draft digital account without having to pay the $49 admin fee per book. So that saves you a little bit of cash. But the uh, great thing is that this is kind of a lead to getting books into Google Play. I don't know where it's going to go from here. Draft Digital has had a tough time getting Google Play to uh, to kind of come around uh, and solve some of the problems that we have, so that we can get uh, indie author books into that program. But this might be a bridge, so I'm pretty excited about it. You should probably be pretty excited about it. Tell me what you think. Is this a uh, could this lead to greater indie presence in Google Play? Let me know in the comments below. Walmart is in the indie publishing news. No one expected that. <laughs> Walmart, and I'm going to make an attempt at this, uh, Rakuten, uh, they formed a partnership that will mean that Kobo eBooks and audiobooks will be distributed through Walmart.com. Now, initially, Walmart and Rakuten uh, partnered up in order to deliver groceries in Japan, which is apparently a much needed service in that region. But the, uh, the deal also includes eBook and audiobook distribution on Walmart.com. This is a great move for uh, Kobo in particular. The Canadian-based company uh, already has a global presence, but this this uh, venture into Walmart could actually lead to some U.S. dominance. Um, this could be a setup to knock Amazon off of the top rung as far as uh, ebook distribution. Walmart as an ebook distributor. I mean, Walmart's definitely positioning itself there. Sorry for the ring, folks. So um, let me get that. <laughs> Sorry about that. Now, uh, this story uh, about Walmart, I would love to hear your take on that. Uh, is this is this going to change things? Is this Walmart uh, vying to take the top spot in ebook distribution? Uh, if so, if not, whatever. Let me know in the comments below. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Wordslinger podcast yet again for another week of interviews. I hope you enjoyed this interview with uh, Ernie Dempsey. He's a great guy. Um, he and I actually have hung out together a couple of times at some conferences and uh, we really enjoy each other's company and we apparently share the same brain so uh, it's nice to it's nice to meet a brother in arms um, if you enjoy the wordslinger podcast I'd love it if you felt if you would help support the show now one way you can do that is to subscribe to this uh, show hit the subscribe button below hit the little notification icon it's a little bell-shaped icon that will let you know when a new episode of the wordslinger podcast goes live on YouTube uh, you can also support this show by supporting our sponsors. Draft Digital, of course, is a sponsor of the show. You can convert, publish, and distribute your books worldwide with support the whole way at Draft to Digital. You can go to drafttodigital.com slash wordslinger, and that'll help me out a little. I get a little kickback from that. But, uh, you know, sign up, get an account, and uh, start publishing your work right now. There's no barrier between you and the rest of the world. You can also support this show by checking out KDP Rocket. Uh, that'll let you take control, get more readers, and increase your Kindle rankings. You can use KDP Rocket for keyword research and fine-tuning. You can use that for all kinds of stuff. You can use that for your keywords for your uh, your Amazon listings and other listings on other ebook e retailers. But it also helps you find keywords that you can tune in for your advertising, such as on Facebook ads, Google ads, uh, even Amazon's marketing services. So. Check that out. Uh, those are a couple of really useful tools for the indie author. I think you're going to get a lot out of those. 
Uh, please support this show by subscribing and sharing it with the uh, the people in your life, the indie authors and will be writers that are out there. Uh, and you can support us on Patreon. If you go to patreon.com slash wordslinger podcast, uh, every dime that you throw my way each month goes into the production and overhead of the show. So thank you so much for that. And of course, as always, if you want to support me and my work, the best way is to go to kevintumlinson.com slash books, where you can find all of my latest books, uh, and uh, including the newest book, The Girl in the Mayan Tune, which is my newest Dan Kotler thriller. That's available on Amazon right now, and uh, it's doing really well, and I appreciate everyone who went out and bought copies of it, so thank you so much for that. Uh, spread the word, tell people about it, and go check out the rest of my books at kevintumlinson.com slash books. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Wordslinger podcast. We're here for you, and uh, we hope you're getting it. I hope. Uh, I, I say we. We've got, I've got a small group of people who help me support this show. Thank you, everybody. And uh, I'm hoping that you're getting a lot out of this. Let me know in the comments. You can also reach out to me at wordslingerpodcast.com. Hit the contact button where you can send me an email uh, and send me a voicemail. Uh, if, uh, if you want your voicemail played, on the air, I play those on the audio version of the podcast, which you can subscribe to on iTunes and Stitcher and anywhere else fine podcasts are sold. Uh, but thank you once again. We'll see you all next week. I hope you have a great week and weekend ahead. God bless. See you next time.